Just a little background again to get us moving in this. 2 Corinthians 7, I've entitled today's sermon, Turning from Sin to God Comforts Those Who Love You. And you might say, well, I'm married to someone who's not comforted by the fact that I'm a Christian. Let me say this, I'll say it in love. They don't love you like Christ loves you. Because you are loved in the beloved. That's the greatest love a person can ever experience. That's the greatest love a person can ever know. All other loves must take second place. Paul wrote this letter, which is called 2 Corinthians, which is actually 3 Corinthians, because 2 Corinthians is missing. He's going to reference that letter as we move through uh, 2 Corinthians. You'll see him reference it at least once, maybe twice, where he's talking about, I'm glad that it accomplished its purpose in you. This church was one of the churches that he spent, or the church he spent the most time in, and yet, even with the Apostle Paul being there, they couldn't get it right. Uh, They show us just how vulnerable the church is, just how eager the enemy is to sow tares, meaning weeds, among the wheat, to put goats among the sheep, to have look-alike Christians in the church along with Christians. That's why in the final judgment, Christ tells us that at that judgment, he will separate the lookalikes from the real. And that, that will be an eternal separation. In the church at Corinth were these antagonists who, they read Paul's letter, and they go, yeah, 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 he talks strong, but he's not here. Look, he was going to come here, and then he changed his mind again. He can't even make up his mind. You can't trust him. He's weak. He's not an eloquent speaker. He speaks from his emotion. He doesn't just stand there and tell you like it is without any emotion. Paul puts his emotion in there, and he truly does. In that day, uh, speakers weren't to put their emotion in. They were just given the facts, just the facts. He's going through this letter talking about his apostolic authority, his pastoral authority for the church. And he's talking about the gospel, the gospel, the gospel, and the God of comfort who comforts us in all of our troubles so that we in turn can comfort others in the trouble that they have. And we have to define the gospel because the gospel's under attack today. The gospel that's under attack is this. God sent Jesus to save you. This is the false gospel. You need to accept Christ so that you can go to heaven. I want to tell you that's the false gospel. That's not the true gospel. The true gospel is this. God has given mankind his holy standard. He gave it in the garden. Don't eat from my tree. Adam ate. He gave it on the mountain. He said, these are my ten commandments. The two tables of the commandment are those that apply to God, those that apply to man. We are to worship God and Him alone. We are to treat others in a right way that reflects God's holiness. Two tables of the law. We can't even keep those. Man sinned against God's righteous decree over and over and over. Because of man's sin, and it goes back to Adam, but we continue to be sinners because we have inherited Adam's sin nature. Because of man's sin, he, we, are separated from God. Not like we're not friendly. We are separated God talks about separating our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. That's how far removed from God we are in our sinful state. 
as far as the east is from the west. No amount of doing good can make a man right with God since man is a sinner who is alienated from God or hostile to God. You can't appease a holy God because you're a sinner. In fact, in your sinful state, the vast majority of mankind does not want to even do things by God's way. Uh, you know that, that Jesus only thing? That's a little narrow. You know that Jesus died for sinners? That's a little harsh. That Jesus who is, uh, died on the cross and the foolishness of the cross, is, it, it, we don't want to be seen as fools. Let's make the gospel friendly to people. That's not a gospel. We're alienated from God. You can't make sinners friendly toward God. God must be friendly toward them. God in mercy sent his son who alone lived, the per lived perfectly before God. Christ did what all mankind who ever existed failed to do and that was to keep God's holy standard perfectly without sin he didn't do it just to say see I told you I could there was a purpose to it and the purpose to Christ living holy and perfectly was that he did that on behalf of those whom God would save Jesus Christ died according to the plan of God, reconciling lost people to God through himself. Reconciliation to God is by faith alone, in Christ alone, not in any works or prayers which we can do. You see, we've made heaven the goal. Heaven is a, a byproduct of being reconciled to God. It's not the goal. All believers go to heaven. Everyone. But not all people who say they believe are reconciled to God. And if you're not reconciled to God, you don't go to heaven. The gospel that Paul preaches is the gospel of reconciliation to people alienated from God through Jesus Christ who kept the law perfectly so that those who trust in Christ and him alone would be made right with God. That's the gospel. The NIV application commentary, Scott Haifman said this, Paul is a mediator of the spirit, not a salesman. He's a proclaimer of the gospel, not a motivational speaker. God's word, not self-help tips, is the tool of his trade. In sharing his feelings with the Corinthians, Paul is not speaking as a therapist, but as an apostle. His goal is not to emphasize, empathize with the Corinthians, but to show them just how serious their sin has been. And what is the seriousness of their sin? These antagonists have come in and they've put Christ plus something else. And any time that you have Christ plus, it's no longer the gospel. The gospel is Christ and him alone. Not in your works. Not in your parents' works for you. But in your desperate need of a savior because you cannot please God on your own. 
The problem is that by following the teaching of these antagonists in the church, they were beginning to follow what Paul calls in Galatians another gospel. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians 1, this kind of sets the stage for us as we talk about what we're going to be talking about today. Galatians 1, 6 through 9. In the church at Galatia were these Jews who said, yeah, 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 you need faith in Jesus to be saved, but you also need circumcision. And if you're not circumcised, you can't go to heaven. And Paul's going, no, 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 no. It's never Christ plus. It's Christ alone. It's not faith in Christ plus do, 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 do to earn God's favor. It's faith in Christ, period. That's the gospel. But are you saying then that Christians don't do? Oh, no, I'm not saying that at all. Paul in Ephesians said we were created for good works, which God foreordained that we should walk in them. It's not about not doing. It's about not doing works as an addition to your salvation because that's somehow going to make you in a better, better place with God and make him more pleased with you. That's not the gospel. So Paul in Galatians chapter 1 verses 6 through 9 says this. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one. But there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed, let him be anathema. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Let him go to hell. That's how serious the gospel is. That's how serious faith in Christ and him alone is. Because any gospel that's faith in Christ plus or has a minus of the faith in Christ and just pray a prayer, you're in, congratulations, is another gospel. Stand with me. We'll turn to our text, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 2 through 7. 2 Corinthians 7, 2 through 7. Make room in your hearts for us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have taken advantage of no one. I do not say this to condemn you, for I said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. I am acting with great boldness toward you. I have great pride in you. I am filled with comfort. In all our affliction, I'm overflowing with joy. For even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted at every turn, fighting without and fear within. But God, who comforts the down, downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted by you, as he told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced still more. You be seated. You might be thinking, wow, where is he going to go with that? That's exactly what I thought when I first started studying it. I'm like, oh, okay, how, how's that preach? Um, 
there's so much there, uh, we might go overtime. What Paul's saying here, and he's been saying this, so this is not new. If you haven't been tracking with this series, you can go back, it's online, you can, you can track through. What Paul's saying is, Erring Christians, erring meaning you're going off into another, another doctrine, or, or maybe you're not yet a Christian, but erring Christians need to come to their senses and stop listening to lies. Stop believing in this whole church growth movement. God isn't concerned about the size of the church. He doesn't care about the size of the church. It's his church. He makes it grow as he sees fit. Stop worrying about techniques to make the church grow. Preach the gospel. Let God give the increase. Stop listening to the health and wealth gospel that all you got to do is send this preacher of the false gospel money and God will rain down money for you on heaven. That is greed and you need to repent of your idolatry of money. Or this false teaching of the health and wealth gospel that if you're right with God, you won't have any illness. You're going to die. I don't want to break the bad news to you, but somebody's got to. You're terminal. It's just a matter of, of facts. And, and if the health and wealth gospel was where it's at, why did Paul have so many problems? Why did he have so many troubles? We're going to read about some of those troubles that he had. Now we, we come to the, the pastors who are doing the right thing, who are preaching the gospel, who are faithful to the gospel. What, what do you do about that? Um, well, you, you go to the big church, that's what you do, because they got the programs. No. Or you, you, you turn on the radio because they've got the personalities. No. You go to the internet because there's so much good stuff on the internet. I say that facetiously. No. Instead of shutting out your pastors who loved you, open your heart wide to them. Instead of looking down, we've, we've got this epidemic of degrading the local church pastor for the celebrity pastor. You can name them. We won't do it. They're not necessarily bad guys. But the celebrity pastor, I told one woman who said, I'm staying home watching TV and I'm watching the evangelists on TV because I get more out of their sermons than I do from yours. Uh, okay, um, no doubt they can be better than me, but I told her, I said, they're not going to come visit you in a hospital. And they're not going to do your funeral. She wasn't a young thing. They're not going to do your funeral. The internet pastors don't care about you. They care about your money, but they don't care about you. Your local pastor, he cares about you. He's concerned for your well-being. He's concerned for your spiritual growth. And, and instead of degrading and looking down on the local church pastor and pastors of small churches, open wide your heart to them. Paul said in verse 2, make room in your hearts for us. Now, we, we, we can get an idea that they had no room. What he's, not, he's not saying, you've shut us completely out. What he's saying is, uh, literally, make room means open wide or enlarge. Just stop putting us in a cubbyhole. And enlarge your heart toward us. We care for you, is what he's saying. Paul is continuing his previous thought about those who are following the antagonists and their false message. He's going on from what we talked about last time, and he's saying, look, you've got these antagonists in the church, and he clearly says before, they are unbelievers. They are preachers of a false doctrine. They are not Christians. Wow. So much for the we shouldn't judge people. We have to judge people, and Paul does. Now, 
the previous comments he had just made that I've been referring to were addressed to the whole church. He's been talking up to this point to the whole church, the whole congregation. He's been saying, look, in your midst, and, and again, what would happen? They would get this letter hand-delivered by Titus to the church. Someone, maybe Titus, would stand up in front of the whole congregation and he would read this letter and people, you can, you can see it, it, it people go, he's talking about them. And they and turn around, he's talking about you. And, and, and it, there was no doubt who he was talking about to the congregation as the letter was read. And Paul's drawing that line in the sand saying, saying, if you're a true believer, separate from them. Don't follow them anymore. Verses 12 and 13. Paul says, you are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. In return, I speak as to children widen your hearts also. He goes on again in our, our second verse of chapter 7 and says, make room in your hearts for us. This idea of you've closed us out. You've been listening to these lies. You've been listening to these, these antagonists. You've been following all the health and wealth stuff. You've been following the big church, church growth paradigm. You've been following the programs-oriented church model. And, and I want to tell you, it's a false gospel. But they're talking about salvation through Jesus. Fine. But it becomes Jesus plus. And Paul's saying, don't minimize the local church pastor who's preaching the gospel. Open wide your heart. Beginning with verse 2, Paul begins to address those who have responded positively to his previous letter, which is the actual 2 Corinthians. So he has this change now that he's making in verse 2, and, and he's just addressing those who have separated. Verse 8, he talks about that real 2 Corinthians. For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, for I see that the letter grieved you, though only for a while. It grieved you. He's going to talk about that as he talks about what true uh, godly sorrow looks like and, and the positive effect of godly sorrow. But he's talking to those now who we would say they repented. What, we, what they really do is they turn from their sin of following these people and they turn to God. Is that repentance? Yes, but really Unbelievers repent because unbelievers can't follow the Lord, so God works in their heart, turning them from sin to God. That's repentance. Christians live a life of repentance. We live a life of turning from sin to God. And, and where the unbeliever is told, you need, to, you need to repent, you need to turn to God for salvation, Paul tells us throughout this, the New Testament, look, you've got to put off this action, which is like the old man, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. You need to be made, be made new in the attitude of your mind, and you need to put on this new action that's like God in true righteousness and holiness. So he, he doesn't often say to the believer, if ever, you need to repent. What he says to the believer is, put off this, change the way you think, put on this. That's the life of repentance rather than a one-time act of repentance that leads to salvation. He moves on and says, don't believe everything, everything you hear about your pastors. Don't believe everything you hear. There's a lot of gossip. There's a lot of rumors. Look at the lives. Look at their lives and the way they carefully teach you. Don't believe everything you hear. Verse 2, Paul says, we have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. 
We've taken advantage of no one. Paul responds to his critics by presenting three proofs validating his and Timothy's ministry. He and Timothy are the ones that were really ministering and ministering to the people at Corinth. Titus was the one who went there carrying Paul's letter. He makes these three statements, and I'm, I'm not going to elaborate on them just to clarify what he means. When he says, uh, one, we wronged no one, that means to hurt or injure. We, we didn't fight with anybody. We didn't punch anybody physically. We, we didn't take matters into our own hands and, and hurt people. Two, we corrupted no one, meaning we didn't teach any false doctrine that led people astray. We corrupted no one. Our doctrine was pure. We would say today, our doctrine is orthodox. We have taken advantage of no one. We literally, we did not defraud or cheat anybody. We didn't lie to you about our needs. We didn't fabricate things so you'd give more. We didn't whip up the congregation and give you false reasons to give. We didn't cheat you. We told you about the need. It was a real need. You gave. That's it. We're, we're not into all this emotional whip up. You give money. You're right with God. No. God doesn't need your money. The heart comes first, and then the giving is right. Paul declares that there, his and Timothy's personal and doctrinal purity validates their ministry. Their personal and doctrinal purity validates their ministry. See, the advantage of the local church is you get to know your pastors. The advantage of a small church, you get to know your pastors um, in, an, in an intimate way. You, you get to see us in, in contexts that in many churches you don't get that opportunity. John Calvin said this in his commentary. These three things, speaking of those three things that Paul just mentioned, these three things by which, for the most part, pastors are wont to alienate the minds. In other words, we don't want to alienate people by these three, three things, or they will alienate them by doing them, the minds of people from them. When they conduct themselves in an overbearing manner and making their authority their pretext, break forth in tyrannical, into tyrannical cruelty or unreasonableness. In other words, you don't get to verbally assault the people that God has put in your care. Don't get to do it. You don't get to manipulate them. You don't get to browbeat them. You tell them the truth. Or when they draw aside from the right path, those whom they ought to have been, uh, have been guides, and infect them with the corruption of false doctrine. Or, when they manifest an insatiable covetousness by eagerly desiring what belongs to another. Pastors are not to be given to greed. Paul lists on a couple of different occasions the qualification for elders, and it's a strict qualification. And no man who does not adhere, adhere to those gets the right to be an elder or a minister. Godly pastors love their children and would willingly die and live with them like any loving parent would. Notice what he says in verse 3. I do not say this to condemn you. For I said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. Interesting way that he says that. Paul seems to be referencing the death and resurrection of Christ instead of simply life together in the church. The common phrase to get today is we do life together. What does that mean? It doesn't mean what it means biblically. 
really the Christian is called to die to self and live to Christ. Jesus Christ died, was buried, literally bodily rose from the dead, ascended into heaven to make a place for us. We as Christians only have eternal life because of the death and resurrection of Jesus. And in that, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, that's our hope. He said to the church at Corinth, if in this life we have hope, only we are of all people to be most pitied. But our hope goes beyond this life. We have a hope, and it's not a question mark hope. It's a confident hope in eternal life with God in heaven through Jesus Christ, our Savior. You see, it's not about doing life together. It's about having life in Christ who died for us, dying to self and living for God. As a godly pastor, Paul is stressing again his concern for their eternal union with Christ rather than just that they function right as a church. I mean, it would be, it'd be great if our church never, and when we're in a good place, which means buckle up, uh, it would be great if we never, ever, ever had anyone criticize anything ever again. That'll happen one day in heaven. But here, Sin rears its ugly head. People gossip. People slander. People form groups and factions and schisms. And Paul warns about that. We always need to be on guard with that. And, and the enemy tries to plant tares in with the wheat. And so you get people coming in and they present all these false things that, that you, you got to say, I know you're, you're new here, but dude, that was so wrong. We are, we are not modalists. We don't believe that God presents himself sometimes at the Father, sometimes as the Son, and sometimes at the Spirit. He, we believe in a triune God. We are Trinitarian monotheists. We believe there is one God who manifests himself in three persons, distinct, not separate. So we have to always be on guard against those who come in teaching a, a, a doctrine that the church historically has put down. That's the role of the godly pastor. Our union with Christ is what gives us unity together. 2 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3, which we've already studied, Paul wrote, for he says, in a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put uh, no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. We're, we, you know, this is the season of salvation. Christ died. He was buried. He rose again for our regeneration, for our redemption, for our justification in God through Christ. That's his purpose. And until he returns, that's the season we're in. And once he returns, that season will be done forever. And the godly pastor puts no obstacle in anyone's way, but preaches the pure gospel. No obstacle in anyone's way but preaches a pure gospel. Sometimes godly pastors must be bold because their confidence is, is in the promised work um, of Christ is leading erring Christians to turn from sin to God. You have to talk about sin. You know, the gospel, gospel means good news. That's what it means, good news. For it to be good news, you've heard it, there has to be bad news. But our modern churches don't want people to feel bad because we're politically correct. And I, I honestly believe the whole politically correct system we've got is the, is the child of the church's seeker-friendly position. 
I think the church is responsible for it. And politics said, what a great idea. Nobody's wrong. Let's love everybody and let's not make people feel bad. And that false doctrine is the child of the modern church movement. And we say it's okay for people to feel bad. In fact, if you don't grieve over your sin and if you don't understand how far from God you are, if you don't understand the punishment that awaits you as an unrepentant, unsaved person, your salvation doesn't mean anything. Because you must understand the sin that has caused you to be separated from God. So sometimes pastors have to be bold and say, that's sin, and you're in, you're in a dangerous area. And you need to think about your salvation. You need to think about if you're really in Christ. Verse 4, Paul says, I'm acting with great boldness toward you. I, I know I'm being bold. I know I'm saying things that are going to, today, commit the unpardonable sin. I hurt your feelings. Um, but I have to because I love you. I'm going to say things that are going to hurt you because I love you. And then he goes on and says, I have great pride in you. I'm filled with comfort. In all affliction, I am overflowing with joy. Look back at chapter 6. And verses um, 16 through 18. 2 Corinthians 6, 16 through 18. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? I mean, think about it. If you're preaching and following another gospel, you're following an idol, not the true God. So what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the, of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them and I will be their God and they will be my people therefore go out from their midst and be separate from them says the Lord and touch no unclean thing then I will welcome you and I will be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me says the Lord Almighty separation from Sin and sinners does not make you right with God. People who are right with God separate from a life of sin. But separating from a life of sin does not make you right with God. You must get the order right. Unrepentant, unregenerate sinners cannot turn from sin to God except by the working of God in their life. And once they confess Christ as Savior and trust in Him and Him alone, they turn from sin to God by the moving of the Spirit of God in them. That's what we as believers do. We turn from sin to God and we do it regularly. We live a life of repentance. Turning from sin to God gives a minister reason to be proud of his children. We, we, need to, we need to be proud of our children as parents when they recognize they've done wrong and fess up. Now, sometimes they just fess up because they know they're about to be busted. Okay? So you've got to figure out whether that child still needs to be dealt with on that issue or whether you say, thank you for fessing up. Thank you for confessing this. Thank you for coming to me. Now, what can we do to help you not go back to where you were? That's the put off the old man, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, be made new in the attitude of your mind. Now, what are you going to put on? Put on the new man created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. That is what we would say is turning from sin to God. It's the life of repentance in the life of a believer. So what, what, that's, that's instruction. That's training your child. When Christians who've been trapped in sin fess up 
and turn from the sin to God. And maybe in counseling they say, okay, this is my sin. This is what I've done. This is what I've confessed to God. Now, how do I, pastor, keep from going back there? Help me put some things in my life that are going to be disciplines that will keep me from going back there. What we are not is we are not Catholics. You don't come to church to confess your sins so you can go out and do more of it. Okay? We, we don't give you Hail Marys. We don't give you any things for, you know, your, your confession. You confess to God because the Spirit's convicted you. Now, I want to help you understand from God's Word how to put off that sinful habit and live in the victory that's found in Christ. But if all you're going to do is come and confess your sins so you can go out and do it again, don't. Because you're not living the life of repentance. That, I mean, that sounds a little harsh, but that's, that's the reality. We're not Catholic. We believe that believers can turn from sin and put in new habits. And we are, as pastors, we are, we are so proud of the Christians who make that bold commitment to say, I've been struggling here. How do I not go back there? One of the, play, one of the things that the church, I'm convinced of this, one of the things the church should never do is condemn people who own up to their sin. Don't do it. Now, that doesn't mean we take away all consequences. Some of the consequences are outside of our control. But we don't condemn because we have a beam sticking out of our eye. And no matter how big their sin is, it's always a speck in their eye. So, I have to look inwardly first and make sure I'm not being judgmental toward this person who's struggling with something that I may also, maybe to a lesser or greater degree, be struggling with. The church should be a place where people can turn from sin to God without condemnation from us. Unfortunately, many times, when someone says, I'm struggling, we only condemn. And, and Paul's saying, that's not right. When you turn from sin, and these people, I mean, they had bad-mouthed him, they had formed these cliques, they had, they had uh, talked down about him, and when they turned, and Titus is coming and talking to him, when they turned, Paul doesn't hold it against them. He says, I'm, over, I'm filled with joy over that. But, but they said some terrible things. Yeah, I'm filled with joy about that, that, that they're not there anymore. But, 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 but what about your reputation? I'm filled with joy over what they have done in turning to Christ. Turning from sin to God brings comfort to ministers who anguish over the sin of their children. We, we are grieved as ministers. We're grieved over those in sin who are under our care and are unrepentant. We grieve over them. The pain of being bold toward their children turns from affliction to joy when sinners turn from their sin to God. Ministry often requires hardships that most people are not aware of. Now, Paul gets real personal here, and we're going we're gonna to go fairly quickly through this because... I need to guard against my own uh, insertion of self here. But understand, ministry often requires hardships that most people are not, not aware of. Um, if you're preaching the gospel and you're faithful to the ministry, the call of God in your life as a pastor, you will face hardships. People will not understand why you do what you do. And and maybe they'll judge that you haven't done it fast enough. But Paul doesn't hide the fact that his ministry was filled with trouble from within and without. From inside himself and outside himself, there was trouble. He says in verse 5, For even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted at every turn, fighting within and fear, fighting without and fear within. Some of these battles 
come from outside influences. Sometimes they're just outside influences not under our control. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 27. 2 Corinthians 11, 23 to 27. I'm breaking into the middle of thought. We're going to get to this in the future, but uh, here's what he says. Are, are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. And he, he can actually say that without any sinful pride. I'm a better one. I'm talking like a madman. I shouldn't be saying this kind of stuff because it doesn't make sense being a humble Christian, but this is true. With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one, meaning 39 stripes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A day and a night I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, in danger from the rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil, and hardship through many a sleepless night in hunger and thirst often without food in cold and exposure and what he's saying is look being an apostle being a missionary in his day being one who went to places where the gospel hadn't been preached there are a lot of troubles a lot of them were external, outside of his control. But some of the battles come from within the mind and soul. Some of those things are in our thinking, in our hearts. Notice what he says, 2 Corinthians 2, 12 and 13. When I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ... Even though a door was opened to me in the Lord, my spirit was not at rest because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I took leave of them and went on to Macedonia. I had a great ministry going, but Titus wasn't there. And, and I, I wanted to work with Titus. And my soul was anxious, not in a simple way, but anxious about him. And so I had to go find him. It wasn't like he could text, hey, hey, Titus, where you at? You know, where are you? Couldn't do it. Verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 28, you were already in chapter 11, verse 28 says, and apart from other things, all those outside things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. That's one thing that we don't have today, and that is Paul, as an apostle, a church planter, he oversaw all these churches he planted by sending men, go there, go there, go there, Timothy and Titus in particular, there were a few others that helped him out, but I want you to go check on them, I want you to go minister to them, I want you to go report what's going on there, I want you to, to tell me how they're doing. John Calvin again said he was afflicted, therefore not merely in body, but also in mind, so that as a man he experienced nothing but great bitterness of afflictions. It was, these troubles were outside. These troubles were inside. Every day he was in trouble. Calvin went on to say, faithful pastors openly set themselves in opposition to those enemies that avowedly attack Christ's kingdom. But they are inwardly tormented and endure secret tortures when they see the church afflicted with internal evils from the exterminating of which they dare not openly sound, for the exterminating of which they dare not openly sound the trumpet. What he's saying is there are things, average church member, church attender, you're never going to know that happen in ministry. There are, there are things, average church member, you're never going to know that I struggle with in my heart and mind. You're not going to know them, but I'm not going to despair because God's a God of comfort. 
that's where Paul rested. He, he, was, he was not a man who could quit. He was not a man who could give up. Never even crossed his mind. He did say, you know, I'm ready to go with Jesus. But I'm also ready to stay here for you. God often sends the right person into the minister's life at just the right time. He is the God of all comfort. The right person at just the right time. Some of you have been that for me. Just the right person, just the right time. You did or didn't know what the need was and you met it. Verse six, but God who comforts the downcast comforted us by the coming of Titus. Titus came. My, my child in the Lord came. Scott Hafman, NIV application and commentary said this, when Titus finally did arrive, it became evident that he was safe and that God had used Paul's letter and Titus' ministry for the good of the Corinthians. Hence, this double dose of good news brought about by the divine hand comforted Paul and Titus. The comfort came through Titus, but its origin is God. When you, we always remember, when you do good to someone, particularly in the context to the ministers who are faithful to the gospel, when you do good to them, God simply used you at the right time in their lives. Your hand provided it because God ordained it. And, and you want to know, what's the will of God? This is one of those times when Paul's saying, look, God provided just, maybe it's a word of encouragement. Maybe it's getting to know the person and knowing what the needs are. Maybe it's letting them know that you're praying. Maybe it's a card. Maybe it's a, an email. Maybe it's a text. Um, I, have a, I have a couple folders in my desk. Uh, one I should get rid of because it's those things that people have said that I probably need to hang on to for a while where uh, they've threatened to kill me over something. Yeah, I got those. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I should shred that. Uh, or, but I got another folder. And it's the cards and letters and emails that are encouraging. And, and sometimes I just, I just look at that going, yep, there's a whole bunch in there. I don't need to read them, but I remember that it's there. And I remember God provided people along the way who said and did things that encouraged me. Um, the preacher, Paul the preacher of comfort, was a man in need of comfort. He was a preacher of comfort. Not a creature of comfort, a preacher of comfort who needed comfort. He was not superhuman. He was a frail man. Paul was not some, you know, ginormous, big, intimidating guy. History tells us he was short and pretty hunchback. Not very good looking. And people looked at him going, <laughs> That's your preacher? Yeah. Good luck with that. But people judge by outward. Well, how does God look? Man looks on the outside, but God looks at the heart. Um, it's important that we understand Paul as a man. He was not very intimidating. But he was a man who derived his comfort from God, the author of that comfort. Verses three and four of, of chapter one in 2 Corinthians, which we've already studied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the, God, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. But understand, God doesn't have a cloud called comfort that rains down on people. It's just not there. The comfort is not mystical. It's not like one day you're under the cloud of discomfort and the next day you're under the cloud of comfort. We derive our comfort from the promises of Scripture and from the people of God. 
That's how comfort comes. When Christians respond in obedience to God's word and God's minister, it becomes a source of comfort and encouragement. And Paul's telling the Corinthians, you encourage me. But these were the same people that were just backbiting him uh, and, and during the second letter. Yeah, but they responded right. Yeah, they didn't hang on to it. He, he's not talking about the antagonists now. He's talking about those who did turn from their sin to God. What an encouragement. Yeah, but what about what they did? Who cares about what they did? You know, bitterness says, I care about what they did. Forgiveness says, doesn't matter what they did. Doesn't matter what they did. You know, I'm a servant of Christ. I'm living for him. I'm dying to self. God used that in my life to humble me. They've repented. Now he, now he encouraged me. Verse 7 of chapter 7. And not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted by you. Now think about this. This is a, a kind of a, a sequence of events. Paul sends a harsh letter to the church at, uh, at Corinth because he had received word, like in chapter, uh, book one, I hear that there are divisions among you and I think I believe it. And then he sends letter two. We don't know what letter two was. Maybe it was too harsh to be included in the canon of scripture, but it, it was a firestorm. And some of them repented. So when Titus reads this letter to the church, some of them, I don't know, I imagine some of them were in tears realizing what they had done. Some of them were going, ah, I never thought about it that way. And turn, they, they physically and spiritually separated from these antagonistic false teachers. And Titus is going, thank you, God. And he's encouraged. I mean, imagine being Titus, being sent to this church, not knowing what to expect, by the way, this is not his first or last opportunity to be in a mess. The whole book of Titus is about being sent to Crete. Cretans are evil brutes, lazy gluttons, liars. And Paul says, and I believe it. But I want you to go there and appoint elders. Uh, you got the wrong guy. No, and, and so Titus was the man for the job. Titus goes there with the boldness and authority of the apostle Paul and says, look, this is where you are. I'm going to read this letter. And he watches people turn from their sin to God, turning away from that which they know is wrong to that which they know is right in obedience to the Apostle Paul. He's encouraged. He's, he's walking on cloud nine as he comes back to the Apostle Paul with the report of what's happened in Corinth, and Paul is elated with it. Again, verse 7. And not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted by you. I'm comforted by the fact that Titus was, Titus was comforted by your comfort that you found in Christ. It's a chain of events. A genuine love for the godly pastor gives him, that is the pastor, reason to rejoice even though the hardships may continue. I can honestly say that for the handful of people who've been here for a long time, if it weren't for you, I'd be gone. I've been here 18 years-ish, 18 in September. We went through some hard times. When I got here, I said to some people, buckle up, it's going to be a bumpy ride. I began to see what was going on in the church and that sin needed to be preached against and horrible things were said, horrible things were done, and I'm so thankful for those of you who stood by, stayed here, encouraged me. We were all the way down to the 50s in attendance, uh, and I never once questioned whether I should go because God raised up people in this church who encouraged me. And I'm thankful for that. Uh, a minister can endure a lot when he knows that God has sent people to encourage him. 
Verse 7 again. Paul says, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted by you as he told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced still more. I, I was already happy with what I figured God was going to do, but I am even more happy. I'm more joyful now because I actually got to see it and hear about it from others. In the New International Commentary on the New Testament, Paul Barnett, the author, write, writes this. Significantly, the Corinthians' reaction to Paul in this matter is inextricably connected with their relationship with God and his salvation. To have rejected Paul's authority in this matter would have been, in an ultimate sense, to have rejected their salvation. To have rejected their salvation. Uh, repentance and reconciliation in regard to Paul cannot be separated from their restoration to God. What you do in response to the man of God who's preaching true gospel is a testimony to your salvation. Either you have it or by your actions you don't. Now, understand, you're not saved or lost by the decision you make about the man preaching the gospel. It's a testimony of what's already going on in the heart. And that's the hard message of the book of 2 Corinthians. Because we, we believe salvation is by Christ, by faith in Christ alone and no works. But Christians work. And Christians respond. And how you respond to the gospel is testimony to what's going on in your heart. So you have to ask the question, what's God doing in your heart? What's God doing in my heart? Where am I? Am I more interested in status quo or am I interested in obedience to God regardless of the consequences? Maybe you've never received Christ as Savior. What a wonderful opportunity. It is Christ and him alone that saves. Not by works of righteousness, but according to his mercy, he saves us. I'd love to talk to you more about Christ and salvation if you have questions. Uh, maybe you've been struggling with things and you need prayer. I'll be up here at the front. Would you stand with me and we'll be dismissed in prayer. Father, I'm so grateful for the message of Scripture, the, the practical nature of your word that is just, not just theory, but you use real men and in some cases, real women, to teach us how to respond to your word. We think of Lydia, whose heart the Lord opened to receive the things that Paul was teaching. We think of Mary and Martha and their response to Jesus and how they had faith that he is the resurrection and the life. We think of Peter who was restored to a, a place of responsibility in the advancement of the kingdom. And, and Father, I thank you for the example of the Apostle Paul who loved Christ more than life. May our lives be a shining example to those who don't know the Lord and even to those who do. Continue to work in our hearts and lives, Father that we might respond to the gospel in humble submission because we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.